Uh, next item on the agenda is the item number nine, Suffolk Parking Management Strategy. Uh, Councillor Evans. Thank you. This paper is a stepping stone on the path to the civil enforcement of parking across Suffolk. In effect, it's a sort of tidying up exercise, crossing more T's and dotting more I's. This is because the Department of Transport requires a highway authority such as us to provide a parking strategy when seeking civil parking enforcement powers. But at present, the County Council doesn't have such a parking strategy. Now, the parking management strategy used to be included in the local transport plan, but uh, light touch was introduced for local transport plans, so we slipped the parking strategy off, and now we have to produce one, and this is all part of the step-by-step process towards CPE. So here we have the proposed strategy set out in Appendix A, and um, we believe it will be a useful tool to influence behaviour and to support local communities and economies. The development of the proposed strategy has involved close working with the boroughs and district councils across Suffolk because, between us, quite clearly, we control most of the available, general available parking space in the county. The county council, as highways authority, oversees the on-street parking and the boroughs and districts operate their off-street car parks. And by working closely together, we will achieve this council's priority of inclusive growth and we will meet the aims of the local transport plan, namely improving accessibility, supporting sustainable travel, hopefully tackling congestion, improving air quality and improving road safety. Now, the proposed um, strategy here before you today is a high-level document. It describes the principles to be adopted when considering parking. It's not identifying where parking places will be in which town and what hours they'll operate. That sort of level of detail about um, areas, the location of parking, will emerge from what are called local area parking plans that will be developed through consultation for our key towns. And we all recognise that in some areas the demands for parking exceed what is available. So the strategy sort of sets out the decision tree for determining how curbside space is best used. You'll see it's listed in the document. Another key area that that comes up often with parking is that the demands for residence parking, particularly in areas close to sound centres, is extraordinarily high. And the strategy describes the new criteria we are introducing for residence parking schemes. And be assured the changes that make it more likely that residence parking will be introduced where requested. Currently, we require a majority of the residents of the households in a street to support a residence parking scheme. But quite often, response levels to consultations can often be so low that while the response level is in support, it's not meeting the threshold. So under our rules, we'd have to turn down those applications. It's proposed that in future, the results of the consultation will inform rather than determine the decision. Now, turning to the thorny issue of parking charges... They are highly influential in the management of parking and driver behaviour, but we recognise that the levels set can have an impact on the local economy. And when setting parking charges, the proposed strategy requires a range of factors to be considered, including the strength of the local economy, charges in neighbouring areas and the relevant transport aims. And the charges will be set always following consultation with stakeholders. Now, one of the subjects that's commonly raised with me and the highways team is the lack of enforcement currently of parking violations. And I think we all recognise that the Suffolk Constabulary are hard-pressed and often don't have the resources, well, actually hardly ever have the resources, to respond to reports of of bad parking. But we all recognise that I think all of us want to see an improvement. And this strategy reaffirms the Council's commitment working with the police and the district and borough councillors to implement and sustain civil parking enforcement across our county. Now, the draft Suffolk Parking Management Strategy uh, was a subject of consultation earlier this year, and it was, uh, went to 145 organisations with interest in transport across the, the county. We had a total of 44 responses. The majority were um, greatly supporting or supporting of it, uh, 
There were some very useful comments that have been picked up already and, and woven into the, the, the draft before you. Um, the, I'll sort of deal with the main concerns. So the, one of the big concerns were about the imposition of parking charges in town centres. And the strategy recognises that parking charges can have an impact on the local economy and it sets up this must be, be considered when setting parking charges. And I understand, of course, why some people do not agree with parking charges, but I think we should recognise that if local authorities are to provide car parking, the cost should be borne really by the car driver rather than by local council taxpayers, many of them who don't drive and don't own a car. So it's, it's who is going to pay for the car parking, and, and that's a, you know, an issue that has to be considered locally with consultation. The consultation also provided some helpful comments, as I say, they're in there, but in summary... We need to adopt this parking strategy to satisfy the requirements of the DFT in relation to our application for civil parking enforcement. The proposed strategy sets out the principles that will be adopted when considering parking, and these are consistent with the aims of the local transport plan and were generally supported when the strategy was subject to consultation. So I commend this document to you and ask you to, to approve the Suffolk Parking Management Strategy and append it to the local transport plan. Thank you very much, Councillor Evans. Uh, do any other Cabinet members wish to comment on the paper? No? Happy to open it up. Yes, Councillor Beer. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, well, whilst I do support the, the whole process here, and we have to go along with this, uh, I, I think it's fair to say um, that I, in particular, have never had any motorist, pedestrian or cyclist in the Sudbury area complain to me about bad parking there um, and it is congestion of traffic we have in Sudbury and that, that part uh, rather than say bad parking um, but I'm pleased to hear that you're certainly going to um, take on board residence parking because that is a concern that uh, parishes as well as the towns uh, have asked for in some cases um, but could I also say that in the Sudbury area we need a multi-storey car park and I was at a meeting and I voiced this the other day, which I know the district council would have to pay for, and they would have to charge in that area. And there was no real um, objection to that being charged. Mind you, I would just remind you all that uh, in the uh, Baber district council area, we do not have car parking charges, um, only if you're parking somewhere after three hours, I think it is that there is a, a small charge come into play. So there's lots of ways it can be done, and I'm pleased to hear that you're going to look at all these before any decisions are made. But uh, certainly um, I can look forward to Christmas not having to worry about where I park quite as much as I would do if you had your uh, regulations in process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Beer. Uh, yes, do you, want, do you want to come back on anything? No, Councillor Soons, over to you. I'd like to say I really welcome this. Um, I represent 20 villages south of Bury, where parking can be significant and a significant problem for people. And, of course, police are out chasing serious crime um, and, and don't have the resources always to, to come and attend to parking problems. And we have instances of parking on the pavement, which is a real problem for some busy villagers when, when school children try and get out. So, you know, it's great that we're taking this on board and you know, taking it to this level, and I commend it. Councillor Finch. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, can I say, in terms of the policy that Councillor Evans has just stated, that she said she would be working with the police, district council and borough councils, um, it's my understanding that the police don't want to be involved in this particular exercise, and so what role will they have in the future? Because it's the enforcement of parking. There's not a problem of parking with residents in Sudbury because nothing is enforced in Sudbury and you Sudbury. park where you like, on double yellow lines or wherever. Okay. Going forward, I'm assuming civil parking enforcement means just what it says and there's enforcement of parking by somebody, whether they are parking attendants but they are enforced by the local uh, council's employees. So where do the police come into this for the future? I was actually talking about working with the police, the boroughs and districts on the implementation. We are still 
away from impl implementation. So I was talking with the Police and Crime Commission today on the efforts we are putting to make sure that we get this through, that we get the permission to move to civil enforcement of parking. So that's not all. Not, Mr. Chen, I'm going to come back. So nothing to do with enforcement afterwards. Not really. We'll be, I'm talking about working with the police to get this implemented. We're, we're still a, you know, a stretch away, and we've got to narrow that gap and get to the day when that paper is signed off in Parliament and we move to civil enforcement of parking. Uh, Councillor Stringer, you were next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to see there's, a, there's now a written hierarchy in, in here of how we use curb space. I think that's very helpful. You know to allocate uh, first to buses if they're needed and disabled people, etc., etc. I think that's a big move forward. I, I actually think in paragraph 60, uh, I've thought about this overnight, it, it is probably a really, really missed opportunity uh, to suggest that at present the technology for electric charging points in our street furniture is, is not been sufficiently tested for a policy to be formulated, I really think doesn't help us in the aspiration to be the greenest county. We've been putting electricity in street furniture for 100 years. Uh, it is nothing new. We have two manufacturers of this technology in Suffolk. The fact that we don't able to be able to formulate a policy in this, I think, is actually missing the trick. Actually, I slightly take account that if the electrification of road transport goes ahead, as many perceive, Actually, cars may not be perceived as so much of the nuisance and polluter that they are. They'll actually be mobile power stations. So them connecting up into towns and cities will actually make them part of the resilience of the local grid. So actually, I, I think we need a policy that's fit for that future. So I think it's a very good policy from where you started. I would have exception, though, with, with paragraph 60. Thank you very much, Councillor Stringer. I, I, I entirely understand why you're disappointed with that. We are, uh, when we develop something on um, electrical charging points, that will be separate from this probably. It is an issue because quite often the street furniture for supplying the electricity is the back of the pavement and the car plugging in is you know, on the curbside. So there's that little bit of geography and trip hazard to negotiate. Uh, Councillor Lockington, did you want to come in? Uh, yes, I, um, uh, Councillor Evans uh, mentioned the local area parking plan. Could you update us on where we are with that? Because that's probably more relating to our residents and, you know, when they have parking issues. Where is that being made up by the local district? So how is that going? I've got some up-to-date information. So the, the, so the key towns where we'll be developing those plans are, and I'll re read the list, Beckles, Brandon, Bungie, Bury St Edmunds, Felixstowe, Ipswich, Haverhill, Lowestoft, Newmarket, Stowmarket and Sudbury. And we will work with the um, local boroughs and districts on those. The Ipswich parking strat uh, strategy is underway, as is the area parking plan for Newmarket. <coughs> and that's been used, the Newmarket area plan is being used as a pilot to inform how we take the remaining area parking plans for forward because obviously Newmarket has uh, particular issues with parking so it's quite a good place to start off working from but those towns we'll be working with the local um, councils to, to develop the, the, the plans that will serve them well Thank you for that Any other questions? No? Yes, Councillor Spicer yes, I've been looking through the actual wording of the policies because this isn't going out for any consultation is it? being consulted on? Ah, I don't remember being consulted, but I'm sure I was, because what I would have... Yes, I'm sure you were going to tell me when I was. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't remember it being discussed. Kind of embarrassingly, I'm going to tell you you weren't. <laughs> oh. Well, I would have liked to have discussed this with my, some of my bigger parish councils, because I've got a bit school marmory, <laughs> school bossiness lately, because the one thing that I think people... It's difficult to articulate in writing, and I would have liked to have found a form of words if you could, is about, we can't enforce, but we should be encouraging through our, um, not just policies, but our communications, what I call considerate parking. I mean, one of my absolute bugbears is people who park on pavements. They put two wheels up on the pavement. They think they're being helpful. They're not. They're damaging our pavement, but that is secondary to the fact that anybody with a pushchair, buggy, um, 
and motorised electric chair, electric um, wheelchairs can't get past. Um, and there's a village that Becky represents, where you see the buggy having to go out into the road. I mean, parish council do know about this in order to go round the car that parks all day with two wheels on the pavement. So if there's any opportunity on the back of this to sort of communicate with town and, borough can- uh, town and parish councils about not just the fine wording of our policies, but perhaps some of our expectations around considerate parking, um, I, I, I'd very much welcome that. Because people think when I say don't park on pavements, they think I'm fussing about the pavement. I'm not. Should be, but I'm not. I'm fussing about the people that can't get past. And having now got a role as pushchair granny, I discover that you can't get along pavements all over the place because where there aren't cars parked, people put their wheelies in a long line down the pavement. So you, you can't walk on the pavement then. So there we are, I've got yeah. that off my I mean, chest. I mean, Councillor Spice, I'll just add to that because I was in the We Are Listening event in Haverhill last, a week before last and it was market day and no cars are supposed to go down the high street on market day. They were parked all the way down on double yellow lines all the way down and right on the pavement all the way down, damaging the pavements, preventing people with wheelchairs, pushchairs and electric buggies from going along the road. And it was the number one complaint that we were confronted on at the We Are Listening event in Haverhill. So I have actually contacted the PCC on this matter because current enforcement does sit with him. But We do have a role too with safety outside schools. Yeah. Um, what we, when we say no parking, we do mean it yeah. um, outside schools. Uh, Councillor Evans. Okay, so, so I'll pick up that last point first, parking outside schools. In the transfer of civil enforcement of parking, we have to spend more money than we would originally thought because we need the TRO to cover the zigzag lines. Um, when the first Act of Parliament went through allowing civil enforcement of parking, they left off that bit. So to enable... Civil enforcement parking is a zigzag lines. We're, we're doing a, a, a catch-all TRO, so they will be able to enforce. Currently, they can be enforced by the police. That enforcement will carry forward. So, so the yellow zigzag lines will still be a no-go area for, for parents parking outside schools. Um, actually, to draw the attention of the report, the, uh, Councillor Stringer took to us to paragraph 60. Paragraph 61 talks about parking on pavements. It's illegal for vehicles weighing more than 7.5 tonnes, which probably could take up some of the market day traffic, I should think, in Haverhill. In London, it's illegal generally to park on pavements unless there are signs and lights allowing it. And the DFT is working on how to, to, to introduce that across the country. I entirely agree. It is very difficult. People think they're being helpful sometimes getting two wheels up on the curb, but it is a nightmare for anybody. Um, actually, even just walking past with your dog, I have to go out on the road quite sometimes, and it, it's, it's, it's not safe. So it's, it's, oh, take your point about considerate parking. Thank you very much. Does anyone else wish to come in? Yes, Councillor Lockington. Uh, Just a little sort of uh, comment, which I think is quite strange, and I hope I'm right in what I say now. As far as I know, it's illegal to drive up on the curb and down again, but it's not illegal to park. The only thing that's illegal if you cause an obstruction, but, you know, you have to have police standing there to watch somebody driving on the curb and off, and then they can get a fine. As I just said, the Department of Transport is looking at how to make parking on curbs illegal. It is illegal currently in London, and it's illegal across the country for vehicles over 7.5 tonnes. Thank you. Yes, yes, Councillor Fleming. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I'm going to throw a bit of a spanner in the works here and say sometimes in the country... um, I have to admit, I have parked on pavements myself. And, and sometimes, actually, you, you just got to do it sometimes. <laughs> no, I, 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 maybe this should remain in this room. But I, but I think... We are um, going out I, I, via I the web uh, to, I, I, uh, to many I residents mean, across Suffolk and possibly the world, but over <laughs> to you. <laughs> I, I think a certain amount of flexibility taking, I mean, you know, seriously, um, taking into account the rurality and the state and width of some of our roads, that I can see a, um, a very rigorous enforcement policy coming from districts could, could really backfire. 
I, I, th I think the realities of civil enforcement of parking is that in future the districts and boroughs won't be employing people to drive around country lanes trying to catch you, <laughs> Councillor Fleming, having parked on a curb. I think you're pretty safe for a while yet. Um, the, the, the reality is, is, is that the, 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 the parking enforcement will be in the most congested, most parked up areas to make sure that traffic flows easily and that um, you know, parking is considerately done and that people can go about their business easily without being you know, held up by a car parked in the wrong place or a van parked in the wrong place. Councillor Jones, this isn't a, another confession, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 we do those in those little boxes. And things. Um, though, um, I'm going to give the contrary view to uh, Councillor Fleming in that uh, uh, I'm, I've got a meeting uh, with my counterpart from across the river uh, in, in Essex, I from, um, from Dedham, uh, which uh, adjoins uh, Stratford St Mary. Uh, Dedham is a really a popular place, especially in the summer. Uh, and we have a significant uh, uh, parking uh, issue there, uh, which we are trying to resolve. Uh, and uh, bringing in some parking regulations will, will, will assist in that. I know it's a, uh, it's a way off. Uh, but at the moment, because of the inconsiderate parking and because there are no parking restrictions, uh, emergency vehicles on a warm summer's day probably could not get through that road. And that is a concern to a number of re uh, residents. So I, I welcome uh, these changes. Thank you. A point well made. Um, any other points or questions? No. So, Councillor Evans, over to you. Can you just confirm what Cabinet is being asked to uh, decide yes. today? I am asking Cabinet to adopt the Suffolk Parking Management Strategy and agree that it is appended to the current local transport plan, and secondly, to dele delegate the authorisation of the final wording to the Director for Growth, Highways and Infrastructure in consultation with the Cabinet Member for Highways, Transport and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much. And can I ask a Cabinet in favour of the recommendation? Can we have a show of hands, please? Yeah, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item uh, is item number in the agenda is item number 10, 2018-2019, forecast revenue and capital spending. Over to Councillor Richard Smith. Thank you, Chairman. This is the second of four reports covering the performance uh, during this financial year. And I bring, uh, Cabinet, a small good news story. It's small in that we are moving in the right direction. The overspend predicted at the end of the year has come down from £8.6 million at the end of quarter one to £7.5 million at the end of quarter two. And I do want to pay tribute uh, not just to uh, my finance officers, but to the hard work that's being done by staff throughout the organization to identify extra savings, cost savings, which can be made. I have um, some optimism that uh, at quarter three and at the outturn at quarter, f quarter four, we will come down a little more but I cannot say that we will come in directly on budget this year. We're all aware of the pressures on uh, local government finance, um, which are illustrated most graphically by Northamptonshire County Council, but we are now trying to learn lessons from what's happening in East Sussex County Council, and of course the uh, list of those counties especially which we know are having some financial difficulties, is a growing one. So we're doing all we can here in Suffolk, um, and uh, I am slightly embarrassed that one area that's overspent is the corporate services area, which I bear direct responsibility for, and I have been looking into that and will continue to uh, press to bring that deficit down. It has fallen in the second quarter, um, but part of the reason for that is we, de we did set some high income targets, indeed stretched income targets uh, for some areas, and we are not going to, uh, to, to achieve these stretched targets, um, and we will, make, we will learn lessons from that so that when we come, uh, as we will be shortly, uh, to publishing the draft budget for next year, the targets that we set for income will be more realistic and achievable. 
Um, the area particularly where we stretched, uh, put in stretch targets was uh, our wholly owned companies. Uh, now, our wholly owned companies are doing well, and they pay us a good level of dividend. When we look, uh, for example, at North in Essex, uh, in, in Norfolk, I'm sorry, um, they're a much bigger company than Vertas, at least three times bigger than Vertas, and they actually return a smaller um, dividend to Norfolk County Council than Vertas does to us. So I think we've asked just a little too much for those companies, and we will learn those lessons in future years. There's plenty of uh, um, figures in this report, and I'm happy to try and answer uh, questions on them, but uh, the report covers two other areas, too, and that's one is violence, which we normally just pass over, and I, I, I think quite rightly, too, because they're just moving one part of the budget from one area of the County Council to another. The details, which are actually less this quarter than they normally are, are in Table 9 on page 222, uh, and really um, the, the biggest item there is to do uh, with pay costs. Uh, when the pay settlement was uh, agreed, it was thought it would be 2%. Well, for most staff, it is 2%, but I think quite rightly, when the details of the settlement came out, it was realised that it is, a, it is a bigger rise than 2% for those on the lowest grades, and therefore overall is costing us more than 2% and hence why these figures are being redistributed. Uh, the other part uh, of the paper deals with Treasury management practices. Now, there is a statutory duty for this Council to report to Cabinet twice each year on Treasury management practices. I have said in the past uh, that I have looked into this in detail, and I believe that our Treasury management practice is of the very highest order. But I would say to you, you don't need just to rely on my opinion, because it's also the duty of the Audit Committee, once a year, to look in detail at Treasury management practices. And uh, the Audit Committee, the Chairman of the Audit Committee, has the right, if uh, she wishes, to come to the full Council to draw the full Council's opinion to any uh, problems in that area. Uh, but I believe we are well advised. We have a small staff who act extremely well and we can be proud of what we are achieving in this area uh, to keep the risk factor as low as possible uh, to Suffolk County Council. Uh, that's really all I want to say to start with, Chairman. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to chip in uh, with a few words about their own areas. Councillor Jones. Um, I don't... Uh, I don't propose to uh, cover uh, ground which I've covered uh, previously, uh, but children's services and um, uh, special, uh, and certainly special education needs as far as education is very much a demand-driven service. Uh, and um, we uh, in Suffolk, like almost every other authority um, uh, across the um, uh, across the country has seen demand rising in, in both those areas. Uh, and so I think it would be um, surprising if there was any uh, significant change between um, um, quarter one and quarter two. Um, the, um, we do, of course, on, um, uh, on the 22nd of November, uh, look forward to being fully scrutinised uh, um, in... Um, uh, adult um, and community services and children's services, and that's the, the main focus of that day. Um, and um, the, um, the, the four transformation programs, which will uh, uh, click in, um, um, which have started, but will take time. One, of course, is the uh, Children and Young People's Alliance, which we've de discussed today. The special education needs, and I remind you we've got a, a paper was uh, brought to uh, a cabinet earlier this year on um, the sufficiency strategy, and we have a PDP looking in that at the, uh, the, the moment, and also managing demand in children's services, and especially in children uh, in care. And, of course, and last but by no means least, on travel choices. So those are the things we are doing uh, to try and um, limit demand uh, going, going, going forward. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Uh, Councillor Evans, you were next. I think I referred last time we talk, talked about uh, finance, about the 
200,000 overspend of the park and ride, which we're determined to get down. Um, Councillor Nicholl has now taken on the job of uh, leading on that for, the, for, the, for, for, for me in looking at new and innovative ways of making those sites more commercial. Thank you. Councillor Hobsonberger. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, ACS is reporting an um, improved position um, in the second quarter um, by £1 million. Um, and I'd just like to point out the overspend is actually only 0.2% of the overall budget. Um, and most, whilst most of the improvement has come from reduction within um, a care purchasing, um, also underspends in um, other areas, um, particularly with regards to um, the staffing budget. Um, that care purchasing um, forecast is, as Councillor um, Jones has already mentioned, is, is a health warning when you are overspending. But the um, Learning Disability Transformation Programme is already um, seeing fruits of its um, transformation in, in that it's reducing the LD um, care purchasing spend, which has helped with those figures. But you will see by that paragraph 17 that we are already um, providing extra, care, extra hours of care per month in home care, um, which is up, for, up to 16,000 from 13,000 in, in quarter one. So we are st still seeing a, a huge um, increase in um, not just LD, but in general elderly um, uh, population with regards to our care purchasing budget. So um, we're, we're um, working well, but there is still the health warnings with regards to the care purchasing forecast and our demand management going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, next was Councillor West. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. On a much lighter note compared with adult social care and children's services, you will maybe have seen on page 219 in table 6 that waste and infrastructure... Um, is projected to um, be £200,000 below, and this is simply because during the dry summer, uh, far less garden waste was placed in residual bins, um, therefore leading to a saving. So I think that, that's one sort of um, upside of um, warming climate. So we hope for many <laughs> more dry summers in the future to make some small assistance to the budget. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to come in? Yes, Councillor Rout. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, where the dry climate gives uh, on one side, it, it takes away <laughs> on another, I'm afraid. Um, my comments are going to echo those I made in quarter one, and I, I really make no ap apologies for doing so. Um, I don't want to pass up the opportunity to highlight once again the excellent work of everyone at Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service whole time on call yeah, and support yeah. services who were tireless in their efforts to keep us safe during this um, unprecedented hot spell and of course to pass on our thanks to the on-call employers and their families. Um, this did though result in additional expenditure on on-call um, hours and associated repairs to vehicles um, and, and more maintenance costs as well. And there's also some additional expenditure which is incurred in part as a result um, of the response to the pilot inspection earlier this year. Um, that's all re resulted in a small cross directorate overspend, Mr Chairman. Yes, Councillor Smith. If I may just come back, um, I, I, I said earlier that I, I paid a tribute to the finance staff and to staff in general. I think what we've heard here is that I should pay a, a tribute to my um, uh, Cabinet colleagues because we all are singing from the same hymn sheet. We all know the difficulties of keeping to budget and what will happen if we don't. Budget overspend has to be funded from somewhere. It's funded from the General Reserve and reserves will go down again this year, as they have for now a couple of years. And we all know that, and we're all working together to get the best value and, the, and, and, and achieve the best ways of delivering the services at the best quality we can for the people of Suffolk. Oh, very well said. Um, anyone else in Cabinet wish to speak? No? Open it up to the floor. Yes, Councillor Lockington. Um, yes, on the top of page... 215. I just have a, a question there, and if you can't answer it now, can I have it later? It's about, you say, with about half the number of customers waiting for home care compared to a year ago, but without knowing whether it's 
one person now and two last year, or whether it's 20 or 25, it would be really good to have some figures for that. Uh, last year, uh, Councillor Lockington, <clears throat> it was in excess of 200 people. It has been as low as 49 um, and tends to be around about 80 or 90 people waiting now, um, which some people are waiting for new services, some people are waiting for a different package. But we have, uh, I think, 3,000 people using care to give you a sense of how many that is relative to the numbers of people getting home care. You want to come back? I just yep. come back and you said some people are waiting for a different packet. I would imagine they still would have the packets they have until the new packet come. In a number of those cases, exactly. There's something changed, something different. They maybe want a different provider. So they're getting care, not getting no care. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Stringer, then Councillor Thank you, Chair. I just want to touch on uh, something that Councillor Smith and then Councillor West said, and probably uh, counter something that Councillor West said. Uh, the, uh, I, would, I, too, was surprised to see the uh, shortfall uh, in, in income and, and the stresses in the corporate services department. Uh, that, that did cause me huge concern, uh, especially when the strategy seems to be not filling some of the vacancies and still trying to drive out some of those savings, etc. That's that's a concern if, if they are the very people that can deliver those savings for you. So there's there's a challenge there for you. I just want to. Flat, I'm, I'm sure it's not news to you, but I just point out that tension. Uh, actually, slight uh, going on from from Councillor West. I mean, where I come from, garden waste is is actually charged for. So I, I couldn't see how that 200,000 saving could be attributed to the warmer weather. What we can uh, a tribute to the warm weather is because the, the, uh, the overspend in, in the fire service. And I think it would be interesting in the future, in the interest of transparency um, and in the spirit of us trying to be the greenest county, that actually we start publishing a line of what a changing climate is actually costing this authority in terms of overspends. Because we'd be able to get clear sight of what it's actually costing rather than it being, as it were, you know, muddled in with a heap of, heap of other costs. Uh, because you know, we, we could then end up with the case where we, we look at uh, an investor-save model, not only for our own finances but also for our wider planet, as well as being able to explain to the public that this thing is actually costing us some money. Uh, so I'll leave that with you. Thank you. Come back on the waste element of it. Yeah, well, I mean, two aspects to it. Not all districts in Suffolk charge for the brown bin. So if, if there's less waste going in the brown bin, obviously it's going to cost the council less. And in the really hot weather, it's obvious that there's less going in. And I, I understand even the where people pay a sum per annum on, in addition to their council tax, um, it's not dependent on how much they put in. It's just a flat fee. So they could put 10 times in than their neighbour and still pay the same. And I, I'm, sure there's a, I'm sure there's an ideal temperature where the, 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 an optimum temperature where we would make savings across the board, uh, you know, probably 22 degrees or something, <laughs> with one day of rain every two weeks. To, um, but yeah, it would be interesting to analyse um, across the whole service as to sort of what difference is made, and it would be interesting. I'm staggered that Councillor West doesn't understand climate. If it's hotter in the summer, it means it's warmer through the rest of the year, which means your spring gets wider. So actually, the, the, the biggest time for growing is normally about May for grass. Therefore, your May is getting later, longer, and later in the season. So actually, it, it cancels itself out more, more than adequately. But this year, the, this year, we had a very hot summer, therefore the grass grew less, so therefore there is less going to the household waste recycling centres or to the brown bins. But today, you've got an exceedingly warm... Yes, OK. Your still growing, it shouldn't be. We, we take that on board, but we're only luckily reporting on quarter two today. <laughs> uh, Councillor Adams, you are next. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if you could... There are a couple of things I just want to pick up on. One is on page 223. 
um, Table 10, which shows an overdrawn balance on the direct schools grant reserve of one million. This is after the transfer of a million already agreed by the schools forum. A further paper will need to be presented to the school forum to consider how the negative balance on the reserve should be managed. So why did they agree to do this without knowing what the impact was going to be? It seems a rather unusual way to do things. Surely if you are going to save money, you need to know what impact it's going to have. But I don't really quite understand what that's saying, because it seems to be robbing Peter to pay Paul and robbing Paul to pay Paul and taking money out of the system without knowing what impact it's going to have. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second is, on page 224, under the reserves, un unallocated reserves, 3 million home to school transport commitment with a f further 4.7 million over the next four years from um, 2019 and 2020. I thought the whole plan from the new strategy for home to school transport was to save money. If you add the 3 million onto the 0.5 million overspend for special education needs, it's actually 3.5 million. So rather than saving money, we appear to be even spending even more money. Perhaps I've misinterpreted that, but perhaps you can explain that to us. And also, the final thing is, universal children's health services, school nursing and health visiting, currently commissioned internally by public health, so it's internal procurement by the county council. Um, and it's in preparation for the service retender exercise in 18, 19, 2018, 2019, there have been additional costs incurred in preparing the bid and reshaping the service, i.e. redundancy costs, so cutting staff within a tender that's already been awarded, surely, uh, which seems a little strange way of doing things. But perhaps you could clarify this. Perhaps I've just misunderstood. If I'll, I'll do the first two. Um, I'll do the second one first, uh, i.e. the, uh, the over... Um, the spending home to school transport. Uh, I'm sure you will recall uh, the, the, the papers which uh, came to Cabinet uh, on, on that point, uh, and that was very clear in those, uh, the, those uh, uh, papers, uh, because um, uh, we are, do, we are d d d in transition uh, from the, the old uh, uh, previous policy to the new. We are not, force, we are not uh, forcing any child to uh, change their school in when they're in that, that phase, whether that be primary uh, uh, or, or, or secondary. Uh, and uh, that was very clearly set out in the, um, uh, as I said, in the paper uh, and uh, re reinforced uh, uh, when it came to um, um, a call in at, 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 at scrutiny. Uh, and so I think uh, we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, covered that, that point and I think, yes, you... Um, um, Maybe you, you, you forgot that was included. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, the schools forum, um, I, really, I suppose this is more of a question uh, for the um, school, schools forum, uh, in that we, um, uh, which is made up of um, representatives um, from uh, teachers uh, and uh, and governors uh, 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 from that. Uh, but um, the um, uh, the high needs um, the high needs uh, block. Uh, is uh, the, the funding does flow in, into the um, uh, into the schools, and they are uh, Suffolk children. And we, we are doing a bit of um, uh, of proposing uh, forward um, um, forward financing. I think is probably the the the, uh, the, the way to do, the, the way to de de describe it. In that. Um, 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 and schools forum have uh, have agreed this so that um, um, the, you know, the the Suffolk children who are in need of this um, uh, get uh, the uh, uh, get the provision um, that, um, uh, that that they they that they require and so the Suffolk forum have, agree, have agreed a transfer from the um, the main block to the high needs block and uh, I don't know whether you want to add any more to that. Yeah. Do you want to come in, Richard, at all? Uh, well, I agree with what uh, Councillor Jones has said. Certainly on home-to-school transport, the, the policy that we agreed at the end of a day and the end of a long consultation period was to provide some extra funding in the short term uh, to, to achieve savings in the medium term, and that is exactly what we're doing. Uh, and uh, the, the other point I want to make about the dedicated schools grant, and it's showing an over 
uh, an overdrawn position is part of that, I understand, is that that money is being used to help achieve the ambitions of the SEND transition programme. And as that programme comes to fruition and provides its, its results, uh, that money will be repaid. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to come in? No, councillor. Ah, oh, sorry. Did I? You've got universal health stuff, do you? Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry, councillor Reader. Yes. Your question about the uh, the retender. Well, as you know, that has only just um, been announced that it's been successful for Suffolk County Council. Um, obviously, when looking at a tender and all the work around it, there's been considerable work in doing that, and also. The, the, with the new uh, tender come, or the new provision coming within Suffolk County Council, there will be members of staff from the other organisation being tupied in, and the restructure will be looking to, to see how um, uh, those people fit in, uh, and there may be re, uh, redundancy costs for the whole system. So um, I think it's quite prudent that that has been put in there. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Finch. I'm aware that this is outside this um, particular timescale of this paper, but it could be worth asking, are we, do we have any indication as to how County Council will benefit from the most recent budget announcements? Um, the work is being done on that now. I actually just this morning uh, had a look at the draft paper to go to the next scrutiny committee, when obviously the budget will be... Um, uh, looked at in ex uh, con some considerable detail, especially ACS and CYP. Um, <laughs> it's marginal. I think there is a little bit more money uh, from the Chancellor's um, an announcements, uh, but the problem of chronic underfunding, and I, Gordon Jones hasn't paid me to say this, but the, the problem with chronic underfunding of children and young people's services and, and, and dealing with children in care really hasn't been tackled very much at all. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions, uh, over to you, Councillor Smith, could you just take us through what Cabinet's being asked to decide today, please? Yes, thank you. On page 211, the Cabinet is being asked to note, A, the forecast outturn position for 2018-19 for revenue and capital spending, B, that the budget is being appropriately managed by officers, and where overspending has been identified, action is being taken to address the impact. C, the significant transfers, environments, in accordance with the Council's financial regulations. And D, the mid-year report on the performance of the Treasury management function. Thank you very much. Can I ask, Cameron, are we in favour of the recommendation? Can we have a show of hands, please? Yes, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. As there's no other business, the date of the next meeting is Tuesday the 4th of December at 2 o'clock, and I've just been asked to ask if everyone could take their mugs out with them. It makes it easier. Thanks very much.